to just go over it quickly. Um, no, you can keep them. Tolkien begins the essay with three questions. What are they? One, what are fairy stories? Two, what are their origins? And three, what is their use? Okay, those are the three questions he begins with. Two, briefly define, discuss what Tolkien means by the word eucatastrophe. One of you, one of you caught me and I had to give it to you. Um, he starts discussing eucatastrophe in relation to tragedy being the highest form of drama. And he says, we need something that describes the opposite for fairy stories. I'm going to coin the word eucatastrophe. So if you put, as one of you did, that it is the opposite of tragedy for drama, I had to give it to you. Okay? How does he define eucatastrophe? One, it's the good catastrophe. You, the prefix EU, means good or beautiful. Like when you go to a funeral and you hear a eulogy. That's a good word. How many of you have ever been to a funeral, memorial service, something? Somebody stands up and says, you know, <coughs> let's imagine Joseph died for a moment. It says, Joseph, man, what a rotten, sorry piece of, and then just, you know, really launches into what a horrible, it doesn't happen. It, the person might have been the worst person in the world. It doesn't happen. You think of something good, okay? So, he does compare it to a discatastrophe, to the possibility of all hell breaking loose, okay? He also calls it a sudden and joyous turn, and then he also calls it a sudden and miraculous grace never to be counted on to recur, okay? Three, Tolkien says of Fairy stories, fantasy literature, should be written for and read by whom? He doesn't say everybody. He says adults. Why? Why do children not need fairy stories? It's one of his ultimate arguments about why these things aren't important for them. They already have kind of a wild imagination. They've already got a wild imagination. They have imaginary friends. They don't need fantasy. They don't need recovery. Why not? Why don't they need to see things clearly? I won't cast aspersions on any of you. I'm 56. As you get older, what tends to happen? You get a little jaded. You get a little skeptical and pessimistic about life. That's why he has that section talking about... Um, Children are not meant to be Peter Pans. They're meant to grow up. And he says, and hopefully to reach their destination. But if they don't travel with hope, they will never reach their destination. Okay? So, they don't need recovery. They don't need escape. Because half the times they're living in their, you know, escape world. Except for children who don't have... Step aside for just a moment. Except for children who don't have the kind of childhood every childhood, every child ought to have. Okay? Who are disadvantaged in one way or another. Abuse, economics, etc. Okay? Um, the four things then that Tolkien says fairy stories, fantasy literature offers to us fantasy, first of all, recovery, <clears throat> escape, consolation. Or, if you put the happy ending instead of consolation, I accepted that as well. Okay? Alright. There wasn't any extra credit on that one. There will probably be extra credit on the next one. I posted to D2L, the announcement site, and sent an email about an extra credit opportunity this week. Okay? If, if you work those nights and you can't... Okay, that's something else out of my control. Um, but read that message. If you want the extra credit, do what it says to do. Okay? Um, and bring me those materials. I don't remember what the deadline was, but by the deadline that is on um, that page. Okay, so, starting McDonald. Lewis says in this introduction that McDonald is the best at a particular kind of writing, and it's a word I put up on the board the other day.
mythopoeic, which means not math, sorry, myth making. And he compares him to a couple other folks. So what does he mean by myth making? How do you make a myth? Well, George Lucas did long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I mean, he creates this myth. So what is it about that or about this or Tolkien's Lord of the Rings or Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, um, J.K. Rowling's kind of universe that is mythic? What does is, what is this mean? Is it just a story that some people believe? No. It's a story that tries to make sense of reality. That's it. It's something that tries to wrestle with main questions. Okay. But it's a story, first and foremost. It's dealing with issues that philosophy deals with, such as why am I here? And this isn't just because your parents, you know, connect you in the back of a Chevy or something. It's, okay, another way of phrasing that. What is my purpose? Now, you can read different branches of philosophy, different writers in philosophy, and they come up with varying answers. All right? Three. Why does anything exist? The Big Bang does not answer this question. The Big Bang answers how. Does it exist? If one accepts the Big Bang. It's 14.4 billion years ago. A singularity, a very small spot somewhere, boom, blew up. That's it. What does the Big Bang not answer? What was before the Big Bang? Okay. Physicists kind of go whoosh, beyond our ability. So these kinds of questions, you know, what is my relationship with others, okay, is another one that figures in here. These are the kinds of questions that myths kind of answer, as well as, you know, why is the sky blue? Why are trees green? Why do birds fly? And I don't. This is what comes to Harry Potter's mind, what happens after we die? <laughs> or part of these two things, is this all there is? Is this it? And then you die. I mean, what is in, I'm getting way off topic. What is in your opinion, and we've got to leave, stop a little bit early because I've got to go to a meeting. Um, why do so many people spend so much money and so much time looking for ET? What's the purpose of SETI? Search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Okay. Why do we have radio telescopes pointed out at, you know, blackest parts of space, meaning the parts without any stars and such, just hoping to hear a like Morse code. And, and whenever there is some strange signal that somebody discovers, it hits the front pages of the newspapers. Why? What might it signify? What might it mean? Something new? What else? We are not alone. See, we are not alone is all tied up in this. Because if this is all there is out of the trillions of galaxies, then that means one of two things for human existence. Either 
we're way up there, okay, or we're way down there. Either everything is nothing but sheer chance, and you know, flip a switch, an electrochemical switch, 11 billion years ago, and we would never have existed. It's just sheer roll of the dice. Or it's all, you know, part of this great cosmic plan, so to speak, right? So, so these are important questions. These aren't things, you know, to be taken lightly. And these are questions philosophers and theologians have said everybody at some point in their life thinks about, deals with, okay? Well, that's this. Usually when we talk about myths, we think of old myths, right? We think of King Arthur, we think of Apollo and Zeus and the Greek gods and all that kind of stuff. We don't think of modern myth. But Star Wars, as I said, I mean, Star Wars is an attempt to answer some of these questions. You know, what, what is the reason for all of this? Well, there's this impersonal force that flows through all living things that has what? Two sides to it, a light side and a dark side. And you can tap into those, blah, 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 blah. McDonald's doing the same thing with this. Did any of you bother to look up the name Lilith? Any of you know what it comes from or who Lilith is? Okay. Mother of monsters. More, any, any more specificity? Adam's first wife, according to later Jewish mythology, later meaning early Middle Ages, 600 and on, okay? various, you know, commentaries and stuff written on various passages of what's called the Hebrew Old Testament or the Old Testament, right, or the Hebrew Bible, because there is a single passage, right, in the book of Isaiah, 34.14, that refers to these things that God's going to get rid of. And one of them, in some translations, it's translated the Lilith. <laughs> Nobody really knows what this thing ultimately means. Right? We do know that the, the very terminology that this gets translated from has origins or has sources way back in Mesopotamia, the Akkadians. We're talking 4,000 BC, okay. long before Abraham, right? Abraham come from, came from Mesopotamia, moved into what was then called Canaan. Today we call it Israel or Palestine, etc. But that's long before him. So there's this idea in the Middle East culture, okay, of this some kind of source of monster thing. Okay? Later Jewish mythology and commentary says Lilith is the first wife of Adam. Okay? Not created from Adam's rib like Eve was, but created from the dust of the ground just like Adam. And when God woke her up and woke up Adam, she immediately said, yo, Adam, you and I, equal. And in some of the Jewish myth, when they're talking about, when she's talking about equality, she's talking ultimately about one thing, sex. She's saying, I don't want to be beneath you. And he's going, I'm not going to be beneath you. You're not going to be on top. Mm -mm. I'm going to be on top, she goes. No, you're not. And so she they're talking solely about sex there. Okay? So she flees. She runs away. God sends some angels after her to bring her back. Okay? She says no. They threaten her. Okay? They say we're going to kill your offspring. She says I'm going to kill Adam's offspring. She finally makes a deal with them. If you write your names, the names of these three angels, okay, on something and put it around the necks of Adam's children, I won't touch them. So, the story goes, 
Adam starts making these little amulets, putting the names of these three angels on, makes his kids wear them so that Lilith won't touch them. But Lilith doesn't, quote-unquote, die. She becomes a demon. In some of the translations that have, uh, I, I said where the word gets translated Lilith, the Latin Vulgate translates that Lamia. In the Middle Ages that gets used. Anybody else know what this means? Or what this becomes in modern literature? Vampire. Vampire. Okay? So, there is no world in which Lilith is a positive, hopeful, life-affirming, life-bestowing character. She runs off. God kind of goes, oops. Rips one of Adam's, you know, ribs out, makes Eve. Adam and Eve get along for a little while, and, you know, then you get the biblical story of the fall. So, that's all background. So where does the novel open? The library. I told you earlier, McDonald, for McDonald, libraries are pretty important. They always kind of loom large. So, our narrator, who we're going to find out is named Vane, right, takes over the family house, and he says in the second paragraph, I've made little acquaintance with the history of my ancestors. That is, I didn't know who my family tree was. Almost the only thing I knew concerning them was a lot of them had been given to study. They liked to read. How much did they like to read? This house is full of books. So the library isn't actually just one room. It is multiple rooms that occupy also multiple floors of this house. So he says he spent a good deal of his time in the library. Why? It was chiefly the wonder they woke that drew to me, that drew me. What's the they? The physical sciences. Geology. Astronomy, right, etc. I was constantly seeing on the outlook to see strange analogies, not only between the facts of different sciences of the same order, or between phys physical and metaphysical facts. Metaphysical, it's a branch of philosophy, has to do with the just being, right? But between physical hypotheses and suggestions glimmering out of the metaphysical dreams that he has. The habit of falling into. So what's, what in the world is he talking about? He's trying to make connection between things he dreams about and the real world. Between what he calls the glimmer of metaphysical things. That's kind of like what Tolkien is suggesting in the epilogue of the essay when he talks about fairy stories give a gleam of joy. And he says, and insofar they are evangelium, evangelium, like evangelist, the evangels, the gospels, and the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, um, Luke, and John. Okay, So what's the evangelium? The good news. Tolkien relates the fairy stories with Christianity. McDonald isn't necessarily doing that here, but he is saying Sometimes the sciences can do what? Give you a glimmer of something beyond this world. Okay? So, he goes on and he talks about he spends most of his time in the great room. That is, the large central library in this house. This is page six, second full paragraph. Why? He spends most of his time here for the history of the human mind in relation to supposed knowledge was what most of all interested me, right? The history of the human mind, the development of the mind, not the growth of the brain from, you know, slime to modern man. That's not what he means. He means consciousness, awareness, ideas, right? To supposed knowledge. This idea that maybe what we suppose to be knowledge isn't really knowledge, we have a new phrase for that today. It's only about a year old. Fake news. Fake news. 
as opposed to real news. Okay? So, he looks at the portrait of an old family member, etc. He keeps reading. And what starts to happen to him as he's in this library over a period of days? He notices a couple of books that seem to move. Okay? And he, he can't explain why. He also notices, you know, there's a door that seems shut, and it's got a book jammed down at the bottom. Page 8, at the bottom of the page. He wonders whether the place is haunted, because he sees, a couple of times, the back of an old man. An ancient woman in the village had told him a legend concerning a Mr. Raven, longtime librarian to that Sir Uppard whose portrait hangs there among the books. Sir Uppard was a great reader. The other day I put up on the board the name of the protagonist in the other adult fairy tale that he wrote, Fantasties. And I said this guy's name was Anodos. That's from Greek. It has two possible meanings. One is the H drops out. Okay, is on or sometimes just a hodos, which means no way. Like anarchy is no archy, that is no structure. No order, right? The other meaning is ah hodos, which means up way, or the way up, like Sir Upward. Right? He doesn't name, give us the same name, but he's playing on the same idea. Right? One of the things that you'll see as you go throughout the novel is this is a novel about growth, right? about upward movement, of sorts at least. So, we hear um, that this old lady says that Sir Upward was a reader not of such books only as were wholesome for men to read, but of strange, forbidden, evil. Mr. Raven, who was probably the devil himself, encouraged him. Suddenly, they both disappeared. Sir Upward was never seen, never after seen or heard of, but Mr. Raven continued to show himself every now and then. Okay? So, he follows this image, hallucination, mirage, whatever you want to call it, all the way up to the, the topmost garret of this building. He's in the attic. And he sees a big, giant mirror stretches floor to ceiling. Page 11. Dusty face, old-fashioned, narrow, looks like ordinary glass. He'd been looking at rather than into the mirror, but suddenly I became aware that it reflected neither the chamber nor my own person. It's, it's like he's standing right in front of it. Say, this panel right here is the mirror. And he suddenly realizes, where am I? Because he's not in the mirror. And he knows what is behind him, and that's not in the mirror. No, what does he see? A wild country, broken, heathy, desolate hills of no great height, but somehow of strange appearance, occupied the middle distance. That is, he sees a foreground, he sees a middle ground, and then there's the background. Along the horizon stretched the tops of a far-off mountain range. Nearest me lay a tract of moorland, flat and melancholy. He might as well be describing Scotland which is where he lives. Right? But that's not what should be behind him. Being short-sighted, what does that mean? You can only see what's right in front of you. So what does he do? I step closer to examine the texture of the stone in the immediate foreground. So he goes up to that mirror and he looks, where's the foreground going to be? It's going to be down here. Middle's going to be up here. Off in the distance it's going to be back here. And so he steps up to look at the stone, and then he sees, hopping toward him, a large and ancient raven, looking for worms, seemed to be. 
no wise astonished at the appearance of a live creature in a picture. The picture is the mirror. What do mirrors usually reveal? Only what is looking at them. Okay? There's not a raven behind him. So he ought to immediately be thinking, not a regular mirror. I took another step to see him better. Stumbled over something. The frame of the mirror. He doesn't say it, but this frame might as well be the lentil of the mirror, a doorstep. And what does he do? He finds himself in the open air on a houseless eve. He turns around. Does he see his house? No. Okay. So stop there for just a moment and imagine yourself in his position. What immediately goes through your mind? What the hell? Right? And then what comes after that? Where am I? Okay? So do you just go, oh, huh, that's interesting. I've got a few hours to kill. I'll go talk to this raven. Or do you immediately get filled with terror? I mean, imagine this really happening. You step outside that door, and you're not in one of the ugly halls of Peck Hall. But you're in a place you've never been before. Wild, outside, wind blowing. Okay. Mountains off in the distance. Other than to, where am I? What would be the first thing in your mind? Would, it, would you be calm like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz? Well, golly gee, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. Or would you kind of, you know, feel like your mind's about to explode? I mean, this is totally outside the realm of possibility, correct? Yes, it is. And yet, it seems to be happening to him. So he talks with the raven. And we're told, one fact only, the bottom of page 11... One fact only was plain. I saw nothing I knew. Meaning, when he looks at the grass, it's not grass he recognizes. It is a variety of grass he's never seen. When he looks at trees, they're not trees he has seen before. All right? So he asks the raven, how did I get here? As if talking to a bird is the most ordinary common thing to do. You came through the drawer, the door. I looked around. There's the bird. Bottom of 12. I was in a world, or call it a state of things, an economy of conditions, an idea of existence, so little correspondent with the ways and modes of this world, which we are apt to think the only world. Notice, we think our world is the only world. Why? It's the only one we know. How many of you have walked through a mirror into another world before? Doesn't usually happen. Now, maybe up here in our dreams, we can enter other worlds. Or maybe through these, we can intellectually enter another world, but we've never actually physically done it. So he says, which we think is the only world, best choice I can make of word or phrase is but an adumbration of what I would convey. Adumbration. It's a shadow. In other words, I can't really come up with the words to tell you what I was experiencing. But here's the best. I begin the, to fear that I've undertaken an impossibility. Undertaken to tell what I cannot tell. Why? I don't have the words. So he's telling us from the beginning. Kind of everything that follows, you may not get it. Why? Because I might not get it from up here to out here. He said, I'm trying. This is Tolkien's whole idea of art, right? To get from the imagination to the sub-creation. What McDonald is suggesting in the person of the character in the novel is, this isn't imagination, this was a real experience. And I'm wrestling to find the way to make it real for you, my readers. So, I didn't see any door, he says. Of course not. 
All the doors you had yet seen, you haven't seen many, were doors in. Here you came upon a door out. What does he mean, doors in? Doors into your world. You've not seen any doors that lead outside your world. The strange thing to you, the raven goes on, will be that the more doors you go out of, the farther you get in. What? Tell me where I am. Impossible. You know nothing about wareness. Notice, wareness. The ness, the quality of being, what it gets attached to. Where, location. Why does he say you have no idea about wareness? What must you have in order to say, I am here? How's the sentence begin? I. I. What must begin? Notion of self. Let me put the most basic question. Pre one. Who am I? <laughs> Who am I? What is my identity? And this is really the most important. Why? Because this is something every one of you has actually got to wrestle with within your college career. Why? Because this helps answer this. Okay? And this is related to that thing every one of you has got to declare a major. Why do you want to major in X, Y, or Z? Is it merely to get a piece of paper that says, I can do X, Y, or Z? I can become a nurse? Okay. To become a nurse, does that mean you are a nurse? Are you what you do? So as somebody who stands on the back of a garbage truck and goes and picks up trash, a garbage man or a person? Or is that merely what he does to put food on the table? See the, the difference between the two? Okay. Some of you might be fortunate enough to have that thing that you are majoring in for the job you want to occupy, where that job will be not only your occupation and not only your vocation, but will be your avocation. It has nothing to do with avocado. Occupation. What occupies you? What you do. Vocation. Calling. Avocation, calling out. That is, you could have been anything. And this is the thing, according to these, that make you think, this is my purpose in life. For some people, their job is their purpose, they believe. Okay? Like, for example, Mother Teresa. She couldn't have done anything else than working with the homeless and the outcasts in Calcutta. Okay. Other people could be other things, but it was all of these things. For an awful lot of people, their job is merely this. That is, they don't really have skin in the game. They could just as soon leave it. All it does is what? Provides a paycheck. It does not identify who I am. Yeah. Okay. So, Mr. Raven says, you know nothing about awareness. The only way to come to know where you are is to begin to make yourself at home. Well, how, how can I do that? Do something. What? Anything. What does he mean? Act. Okay. And this is where I think McDonald is probably showing some of the inf influence of a Danish <coughs> philosopher 
who was alive at the same time, writing named Soren Kierkegaard. Right? What does that mean? I just, it never even hit me until just now. His last name means church protector. Okay? Kirka is the Danish form of Scottish, Kirk, English, church. Guard, guard, protector. Okay? Kierkegaard was a quote-unquote Christian philosopher who is kind, of, is kind of regarded as the father of existentialism, existential philosophy, which essentially says there are multiple versions of it. One version of it is life is without meaning until you do something to give your life meaning. Anything. Otherwise, you haven't really existed. Not like I'm not physically here, but nobody will know I existed. Right? What's well, one thing almost everybody wants? They want to know that when they die, people will know they lived. They, they want to leave a mark of some kind. Okay? So, this branch of philosophy, of, of existentialism, says the way you do that is you act. It doesn't really matter how you act, according to some of these philosophers. In other words, you can act. By helping the little old lady across the street, or you can push in front of a truck that's coming. Either way, you've acted, right? She'll know you acted. <laughs> Whichever way you did it. You can be Hitler, or you can be Mahatma Gandhi. Doesn't really matter. We, we know both of them. Why? They both chose to act. So, that's what Mr. Raven is saying, by doing so, what? Anything. And the sooner you begin, the better. For you are, until you are at home, you will find it as difficult to get out as it is to get in. And he's like, I don't, I don't get what you're saying. I have unfortunately found it too easy to get in. Once out, I, I'm not coming back. Because once I get back to my house, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to find any more of these doors. I'm going to stay put. You have stumbled in and may possibly stumble out again. Whether he, you have got in, unfortunately, remains to be seen. Why? What does fortunately and unfortunately mean? <laughs> Fortunate means it goes in your favor. Unfortunate, Unfortunate is the other way. Well, how do you know it goes in your favor? Because McDonald was playing on... First of all, he's being very, being very precise with words, okay? But he's playing on this notion of fortune, or the goddess Fortuna, old, okay? classical, late antiquity, medieval. And the goddess Fortuna had a wheel that she would spin. That spinning wheel was what we call fortune. I mean, you can turn on the TV in the afternoons and watch Wheel of Fortune, right? Well, this wheel is always spinning. Where do you think you want to be on this wheel? Do you want to be here? No, why not? Yeah, exactly. It's going this direction. So what does it mean to be here on Fortune's Wheel as opposed to be here? This is the guy standing on the side of an on-ramp or exit ramp to Interstate 24. Homeless, hungry, lost my job, help. This is Jeff Bezos. Richest man in the world. Or Bill Gates or George Soros or, you know, pick your billionaire. It's good to be here. What's the problem with being here? The wheel doesn't stop. It keeps turning. And the perception is that when you're here, how fast is the wheel turning? Slow. Like it has stopped. But it starts to get better and better, and speed picks up. 
and you get here, and it's like you reach the apex, and suddenly, boom, this is how most tragedies in terms of literature and plays work. You have a tragic hero who rises to greatness, and he reaches that pinnacle of greatness, and what happens? Boom, he falls. All right? So, fortunately means it was a good thing that you found your way in here. Okay? Unfortunately means leading to bad things. Which is it going to be? We're going to see. All right? So, um, Mr. Raven asks him, page 14, who you are. Tell me this. Who you are, if you happen to know. How should I help knowing? I am myself and must know. If you know you are yourself, you know that you are not somebody else. This is actually classical logic. How do I know what this is? See, imagine you've never seen this before. Here, let me, let me use this. This is a perfect example. Show you this thing. Describe it. Describe it doesn't mean tell me what it is. It means tell me what it looks like. Tell me its color. Metallic. Metallic. Silver maybe, chrome kind of. Thing. It's got a shape to it. You can't tell what its shape is from that side. Right? You don't know what it is. You can tell me its attributes. I could turn it around and pass it around, and you might be able to figure it out. It is actually a bottle opener in the shape of a badger. Okay. As written on the back, Badger Set. Official beer taster of 1777 Badger Set Ale Club. It's a British beer that I really like. Okay. But you don't know what it is just by knowing what it looks like. Similarly, you don't know what this is just by knowing what it looks like. One of the ways you know what this is is you know what this is because it's not this, right? What's the difference between this? Just sheer appearance. This and this. Nope. Cylindrical, transparent, more or less. Container, it's got something in it. This, rectangular. Dark, this is not dark, this is not transparent, this is shiny on this side, but dull on this side, right? this is thicker than this, right? so one of the ways we know what things are is by knowing what they're not, you know, this is what it is because it's not this, okay, pretty, that's pretty simple, it's, that's basic logic, so, he says, if you know you are yourself, you know that you are not somebody else. But do you know that you are yourself? What? It's like he's playing counselor, psychologist mind games with them. Do you know you are yourself? Are you sure you are not your own father? Or, excuse me, your own fool? Who are you? I became at once aware I could give him no notion of who I was. Indeed, who was I? Who am I? Is one of those questions. It would be no answer to say I was who. Then I understood I did not know myself, did not know what I was, had no grounds on which to determine that I was one and not another. As for the name I went by in my own world, okay, how long has he been in this other place? Is it hours that have gone by? Yeah, not seemingly on the basis of this conversation. It's ten minutes. And he forgets what? His name. And I did not care to recall it. Why? For it meant nothing. Does your name really define you? My name, Theodore. If we were to go by that, you know, the etymology kind of thing like I did here, that means gift of God. A lot of people would say, not true. Other place, you know. 
and did not care to recall it, for it meant nothing. And what it might be was plainly of no consequence here. I had indeed almost forgotten that there was a custom for everybody to have a name. So he says, I held my peace. And the old man says, look at me and tell me who I am. He spoke, he turned his back. Ah, that's the old librarian. Turns around and it's the raven again. He says, I've seen you before. Okay. We're going to stop there because, like I said, I've got to leave early to go to a meeting. So keep reading. Just read it. Don't try to understand every, you know, single passage. We will go through it more quickly on Wednesday because there's a couple of major, really major passages I want us to, um, to get to.